I'm Charlie Davis, WCSC News. From Nashville, Tennessee, this is John Rivers Ingram wishing my grandfather, John Rivers, and his radio station a happy 55th anniversary. 79 degrees downtown at CSC, and we're speaking with Russell Long. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning, sir. You were program director of WCSC Radio back in, what, 1938 to 53, was it? No, about 1942. 1942. Well, I've been wrong before. So. You know, I think uh, my name, of course, is Russell Long, but among the uh, handles that I acquired was Uncle Russ. And, well, we had a bunch of kids about from age up to... Uh, as old as age 14. Mm -hmm. And we ended that program about 1950. Now, a lot of those people are still around. Sure. But they introduced me to their children. This is why I know time is really gone. Yeah. But um, I tell you, so if you will, just call me Uncle Russ. I'll okay. feel better. <laughs> All right, Uncle Russ. I feel actually better, too, to be honest with you, to tell you that. <laughs> But uh, you were program director uh, back, uh, uh, you said, 1942. What was radio like uh, back in those days? Well, I'll tell you, it was pretty rough because that was during the war, mm -hmm. and mail announcers were scarce. We had, um, well, I was there to fill in. Mm -hmm. We had two men who were not truly experienced. One was, I take that back. Right. And we had three females, one of whom was a very... A distinguished uh, uh, lady of Charleston, who refused to read a commercial about a, a laxative. About a laxative. A laxative. Okay. And she said, "What will my friend say <laughs> if they hear me reading this commercial about a laxative?" Well, I said, "It's on your shift. The commercial schedule. It's been promised to the sponsor. Well, I will not read it." Oh. He's what do you want to do? Take a leave, permanent leave, or read the laxative commercial? She wants to change shifts. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we had three women, women. We had two citadel professors who did very well. So we held that staff together mm -hmm. and managed to make shift until the war was over. And then we assembled a, a very fine staff. But um, in 1945, when Roosevelt died... Mm -hmm. I was doing a 6 o'clock newscast, which was to be five minutes in length. Right. And we always kept somebody by the teletype in the event any big news broke. And he came in with a sheet of paper about three yards long. And you knew something was wrong. Yeah, uh, right. So we stayed on air, well, I guess about 30 minutes reading about Roosevelt's death. Right. And that was it. But during that time, though... We could not give, baseball was still going on, but if a game was canceled, we could never say it was canceled due to rain. All right. Because you were talking about the weather, and the spies, the enemy, might learn about the weather condition. Interesting. So you just said the game was canceled. Yeah. And uh, many the morning, when our studios were atop the Francis Marion Hotel, I look out the window at uh, what we call Rebellion Roads mm -hmm. by Sullivan's Island, and, oh, I guess about six or seven or eight cargo ships ready to go across the Atlantic, waiting for the destroyer escort to come down the Copper River to pick them up to give them protection. And uh, it was like a bunch of hens just sitting, waiting for protection to come. Now, you're talking to a farm boy, so I know exactly what you're talking about. I've right. I've been sitting around hens for quite a while. And during the war, we... Uh, did broadcast from the naval base uh, when a ship, a naval ship, was launched, and I have a picture showing the lady breaking the bottle of champagne over the bow, mm. and it's falling all over me. Well, I opened my mouth to try to catch <laughs> some of it. Sure, you did. <laughs> Why not? That's right. During the war, you get things that are free, right? Yep. But uh, well, I'm curious about the laxative. Uh, you kind of passed over that once you said she refused to do that. Uh, well, did, we got someone else to do it. The commercial did get on the air. Naturally. And, uh, well, if you think in those days we could refuse to make money, no way. Yeah, all right. All right, this is a, a quick question I want to ask you. It's all about a shotgun in the control room. Did you all keep Well, shotgun? the old man was afraid that somebody might invade Charleston take over the city, and of course the first thing they want to get control of is the radio is station. Is the radio station. 
to make everybody feel and tell them what to do. Right. So he put a sawed-off shotgun in the control room. <laughs> Who was manning the shotgun? Just uh, it, <laughs> We hit it. Well, nobody wanted to use it. We were afraid it'd explode right. and kill us. <laughs> <laughs> Safety first, huh? We put it where nobody could find it. And luckily, um, I did that because one morning, one of the announcers came in and he was under the weather, should I say. Mm -hmm. And he was mad with his wife and he wanted the shotgun oh boy. to take home. So I told him it was gone forever. Good thing you hit it that day. Boy, you're not kidding. But, uh, but the shotgun was there to protect the city of Charleston from any enemy control of CSC radio. And to protect the announcers, of course. <laughs> Poor old announcers. <laughs> we don't want to get caught in this thing. No. It's 1029. Uh, Uncle Russ, we're going to be right back with you after we play a tune here. And uh, you sit tight with us.